Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Abby Lieberman, and I'm excited to welcome you today. We're looking forward to having this group of early childhood advocates together. We know this is a busy time, so we appreciate you stepping away to join us for this discussion about navigating higher education policy. We invited you today because of your interest in early education, and more specifically, the early education workforce. High quality, access to high quality higher ed is an important component of strengthening our early childhood workforce. But for more early educators to realize the promise of higher education, we need significant reform to improve access and quality of degree programs. That's why we think it's important for our early ed community to have a strong understanding of higher education policy. It can be helpful to know how higher ed laws impact early educators and what levers advocates and policymakers can pull to help federal rules and regulations better serve our community. We recognize that many of you have been working on issues related to higher ed, maybe navigating your state higher ed systems for many years. Um, there are also some of us joining today who have limited knowledge of higher ed policy or who could benefit from a refresher on the basics. So regardless of where you're at, we know you might still have questions coming up. And today we wanna to help connect the dots between higher ed and early ed. So on the next slide, um, for today's agenda, we'll start off with introductions and some brief background on New America's recent early childhood and higher ed collaboration. Then we'll cover how higher ed issues pertain to early educators broadly, and also explain how our team is thinking about these issues in the current context of COVID. And lastly, we'll leave a good chunk of time for Q&A. We really see this webinar as an opportunity to ask New America's higher ed policy experts questions you're grappling with. So please don't be afraid to speak up. We really wanna hear from you. You can ask questions in the chat function throughout the webinar, um, and just know that we will have a good chunk of time set aside at the end slide please. So as I mentioned, I'm Abby and I'm a senior policy analyst on our early and elementary education team. And today you'll also be hearing from Claire McCann and Iris Palmer, two of our team's higher ed experts who are excited to share their knowledge with you. Slide. So I'll start with just a little bit of background on New America's education policy program. We work to strengthen and improve our educational system so that all students have equitable access to high quality learning and prepare them for college, careers, and civic life. Our team uses original research and policy analysis to help solve the nation's critical education problems. We suggest new ideas for policymakers, educators, and the public at large. Our work explores the full range of educational opportunities from early learning to secondary um, education up through college and the workforce. So this slide just shows um, the different education teams at New America and on our early ed team, much of our work focuses on birth through third grade educators, both teachers and leaders. And today we're focusing on the intersection of our early ed and higher ed work. Next slide. Thanks. So this webinar actually builds off an ongoing body of work where our early and elementary education team has been exploring how two and four year institutions can better equip those teaching and caring for young children. As we know, many early educators pursuing their degree are balancing full time employment, caregiving responsibilities, and low wages with their coursework. And we think higher education can do more to remove the unnecessary hurdles that make it difficult for this population to complete their degrees. And with early ed programs increasing qualification requirements in recent years, this is becoming a more urgent issue because we need these new policies to help build up the current workforce instead of keep people out. Slide. So too often in discussions about early educator preparation, faculty members, deans, and higher education policy content experts are left out of the conversation. So last fall, we partnered with our higher ed team to convene the Supporting Early Educator Degree Attainment Working Group, which consisted of 18 experts across fields to delve into the barriers institutions face and explore opportunities for reform. We released the findings of this working group in a report earlier this month, um, and you can find the report at the address listed above on New America's website right at the top. Um, and I'm just going to give a really brief overview of what's in this paper before I hand it over to Claire and Iris. So that on the next slide. Um, so in this report, we identified key barriers that institutions face to preparing early educators. Our working group discussed several barriers, but these are the five that rose to the top. Um, so, you know, making sure 
supports are in place for this population of students to be successful, um, serving the unique needs of this linguistically diverse workforce, um, supporting developmental and remedial education requirements, navigating requirements around clinical experiences, and supporting faculty recruitment and development. And thanks, Iris, I saw you added the link in the, in the chat, great idea. Um, next slide, please. So then we explored um, ways that institutions are overcoming those barriers. So here's a list of the programs that we profile in the paper. In some categories, like student supports, we were able to identify numerous examples um, and it was difficult to narrow it down. In other cases, it was difficult to find um, even one or two promising practices. So if any of these are of interest in you, we encourage you to check out the report for profiles um, and explaining what these programs are doing. Slide. And a primary goal of this work is to suggest concrete ways that the field can improve the quality of early educator preparation. The federal government, states, localities, institutions, and philanthropy, they all play a unique role in shaping policy and practice. In some instances, simply bringing attention to a barrier can spark change, while other times a financial incentive or a change in law is necessary. The working group explored which levers policymakers and other stakeholders can pull to alter the system to better meet the needs of the workforce. We came up with an, quite an extensive list um, that is included in the paper. And today on the next slide, um, here's an overview of the main federal levers that the government can pull based on the barriers that we um, explored in the paper. So as you can see, increasing funding for various programs like Pell Grants um, or federal child care programs also was a main theme of how the federal government can play a role. But I know even I was not familiar with some of these programs um, that might better support the early educator workforce or not as familiar as I'd like to be. So I'm looking forward to learning more from Iris and Claire today also. Um, and with that, I will transition it over to them to share their knowledge and fill in some gaps for us. Thanks, Abby, and uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, once again, this is Claire McCann uh, with New America's Higher Education Program. We thought we would start off today with a little bit of an overview of the Higher Education Act and its framework, and then talk a little bit about where things stand today. Um, the Higher Education Act is the primary law underlying federal investments in higher education. It was first authorized in 1965 um, and in contrast to other education laws, including the child care law, states play almost no role in the legislation. Uh, next slide, please. Instead, the federal government authorizes funding directly to institutions of higher education through the student as a voucher program. Um, funds are included in Title IV of the Higher Education Act. They include about $30 billion a year in Pell Grants around $130 billion every year in federal student loans, which are not pictured in this chart um, because much of the funding is later repaid, um, as well as other smaller grant programs like the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant called SEOG and Federal Work Study. Uh, as you can see, federal spending on Pell Grants actually dwarfs federal investments in other educational programs like CCDF, Head Start, Title I of the K-12 authorizing law, the ESEA, um, and IDEA special education dollars. Um, so let's dig in a little bit on Pell Grants. Only about half of Pell Grant recipients are dependent, traditionally aged students. Uh, the other half are independent students who are often older than 24. Uh, they might be married or they might have a child, for instance. Um, so, as you can imagine, plenty of early childhood educators who go back to college are likely eligible for the Pell Grant um, to help them pay for the cost of enrolling. The maximum Pell Grant award right now is $6,345 a year. Um, Two thirds of all Pell Grant recipients come from a household income of $30,000 or less. And since nearly three quarters of center based early educators are making $15 an hour or less, um, they very likely are eligible for Pell Grants, even if they're working when they go back to school. But with college costs growing fast, that amount actually covers the smallest share of the cost of attendance in decades, even as the size of the grant has continued to increase year over year. Next slide, please. While the Pell Grant covered 79% of tuition fees, room and board at a public four-year college in 1975, today it covers just 29%. So as Pell Grants cover less, 
states are failing to keep up their investments in public higher education and costs are continuing to grow at colleges. So more of that is being shifted to students uh, in the form of debt. So no doubt you've all heard a lot about the rise in student debt since it's so often in the news. Uh, but actually with undergraduate loan limits fairly strict uh, and unchanged since 2008, the amount that's borrowed by undergraduate students hasn't actually changed that much. More than half of borrowers, 55%, who have outstanding student loans today owe less than $20,000. And instead, what we've seen is much of the growth has been in borrowing for graduate school. 40% of the loans made every year for graduate school. And in fact, more than 40% of all outstanding federal loan debt today is held by the 10% of borrowers who owe $80,000 or more. Next slide, please. The federal government has invested significantly in making student loans more affordable for those who need it. So chief among those investments is the creation of income-driven repayment plans that help make borrowers' payments more affordable. Income-driven repayment plans are ones that allow borrowers to repay based on a percentage of their income, so 10 or 15 percent, with any remaining amounts forgiven after 20 or 25 years, depending on the plan. Borrowers are eligible for different versions of these plans depending on when they took out their loans. But what we've seen is that many of the borrowers who need this assistance the most, likely including many of the low-paid borrowers who are in the early education workforce, aren't necessarily taking advantage of them. Almost 9 million student loan borrowers, which is a third of all, all borrowers, and half of student loan debt held by the education department are now in an income-driven repayment plan. Disproportionately, the people in those plans have very high debt loads. They're more likely to be doctors and lawyers and other people who took on debt for expensive graduate school programs than they are to be early educators who sought an associate or bachelor's degree to meet the educational qualifications for their jobs. And even when borrowers do gain access to income-driven repayment, they sometimes miss the follow-up. So data that are admittedly now relatively old suggested that about half of borrowers in those plans weren't submitting the paperwork on time to renew their annual income information that's used to calculate their payments. So that can cause borrowers payments to spike um, because they get kicked out of the plan and onto a more expensive plan uh, and it can cost them more in interest as well. Next slide, please. So while the vast majority of student loan borrowers are current in their debts and able to repay without much sign of trouble, there are some pockets of challenges in the student loan portfolio. Uh, the first one I wanna talk about is for-profit colleges. For-profit student loan borrowers default at twice the rate of community college borrowers, 52% versus 26% within 12 years after leaving school. And they're also much more likely to borrow, so they're at a much higher risk. The second one is college dropouts. Students who drop out with debt and no degree are three times more likely to default on their loans than students who graduated. And often these are borrowers with only a few thousand dollars in student loans. And the third is black borrowers. Black borrowers with debt, even those who graduate, default at a much higher rate than their white peers. And this is, of course, likely in large part because of a sizable racial wealth gap and because of labor market discrimination, as well as higher rates of black student enrollment in for-profit colleges and lower rates of college completion. So that's of particular concern given that at least 16% of early educators, maybe more depending on the childcare setting in which they work, are black. So of course today, most federal student loans are currently in an interest-free forbearance because of the pandemic. So that means none of those borrowers are required to make payments on their student loans right now. That forbearance is scheduled to expire on December 31st, which means we might see additional new challenges beginning next year as people come back into the system and, and once again, owe payments on their loans. Next slide. So I'm gonna take a little bit of a step back and talk about some of the other players in the higher education system as well. In exchange for access to Pell Grants and loans, colleges have to comply with a whole host of federal rules uh, 
both for the management of those federal dollars and for other requirements that are designed to protect taxpayers. One of those requirements is that all institutions must be authorized by their states, accredited by a recognized accrediting agency, and they must enter into an agreement with the Department of Education confirming that the school will comply with federal rules and regulations. So that makes accreditors another particularly important player in higher education for this group to be aware of, um, since accreditors are the ones charged with academic quality for the college as a whole. States also invest billions in addition to federal spending to support public colleges. And through the authorization process, they're responsible for some basic consumer protection requirements, including receiving and investigating complaints from students. So that's uh, states are another important actor in this. Next slide, please. So back to the Higher Education Act, the HEA was last reauthorized in 2008, which means it has been overdue for reauthorization since 2013. Last year, it was finally starting to look more and more likely that reauthorization would happen. So the House Democrats introduced a comprehensive reauthorization bill called the College Affordability Act. It was approved by the House Education Committee um, and Democrats were pushing to bring the bill to a vote by the full House. At the same time, we were hearing rumors that Lamar Alexander and Patty Murray who are the leading Republican and Democrat on the Senate Education Committee, their pictures are off to the right there, were seriously negotiating on a bipartisan HEA bill. They had even had some limited success. They worked together to pass a bill that permanently extended funding for historically Black colleges and, and other minority serving institutions after that funding had expired. And it also allowed for data sharing that would help more students apply for federal financial aid more easily. Uh, and that bill, which was called the Future Act, was signed into law just before Christmas in December 2019. Uh, Senator Alexander is set to retire at the end of this year, and the HEA is his last major outstanding education priority. By February or March of this year, it seemed like Senators Alexander and Murray were nearing a deal. And so it was kind of this perfect confluence of events for the Senate to reach an agreement and the HEA to finally be reauthorized. Iris, I'm going to hand it to you. Yeah, Angela, if you could change this uh, slide. Um, so then COVID-19 happened and everything, of course, changed. The focus went to the uh, millions of students who had to leave campuses suddenly and try to do um, engineered online learning with faculty at home with limited internet access in a lot of cases. I wanna just make a note here that the early educator population probably even has more difficulties with this and connectivity. Um, colleges had to reimburse students for housing and food and states immediately started talking about cutting higher education as it is an easy priority for them to cut because they can backfill it with um, uh, student, student fees and tuition. Um, so colleges uh, launched an all-out campaign to get emergency funding to cover these losses, and they lobbied hard for their share of trillions of dollars of emergency relief. And when Congress passed the CARES Act in March, um, higher education got $14 billion in funding, um, half of which was used to make emergency grants to students who had to leave campus uh, in the middle of the semester due to the pandemic. Um, so, it's looking less and less like high, like um, Congress is going to pass another emergency relief bill or how big that's going to be. Uh, and we've had been speaking to dozens of people across the country about um, how this is playing out in colleges. We've been talking to college leaders, accreditors. Um, we've been talking to students and faculty and really trying to get a sense of what this pivot is looking like on the ground at colleges. And we've heard about these financial impacts um, and that they're getting worse. So um, the longer the pandemic goes on, as with the rest of the labor market and the rest of our system, uh, the more stress is being put on colleges and also students. 
So we've heard that right now colleges are using their reserves in a lot of cases, um, but those funds are dwindling. And uh, in the spring, many states actually used their care funds allocations to backfill a lot of the cuts they were making to higher education mid-year. Um, and so for instance, Colorado um, cut higher education about almost $500 million or almost 60% of their entire funding to higher education. Uh, but they used CARES Act funding to backfill that. And so they um, only ended up cutting higher education in reality, $43 million. But since no new stimulus seems to be coming, we know that these cuts are going to be um, extreme, I would say, uh, in the spring as the new state budget cycle uh, commences. We've also been hearing about substantial drops in enrollment. And this is particularly true at the community college which is really important for the early uh, childhood educator uh, workforce because many of them are at community colleges. And they educate millions of students uh, every year. Um, and we've saw a 9% so far drop in enrollment at community colleges, which has been particularly steep for black students and is particularly steep for first year students. A 21% a of first time students, um, it's down 21% for their enrollment. And that means that many students, particularly early educators, are putting off their education plans and may likely never enroll in higher education because community colleges really are the on-ramp to higher education for many people in this population. We've also heard about expensive nonprofit colleges that are seeing substantial drops in student enrollment uh, as students choose a gap year rather than taking um, a full, paying full price for an online experience. Think about colleges like GW here in DC. Um, these enrollment drops are, are not only troubling for student access to education, but especially for the early educator population, um, getting them enrolled and getting them enrolled now. As they put it off, they're way less likely to continue to enroll. So we heard, also heard a lot from college leadership about the pivot to online education. And the leadership of colleges seemed to think that the pivot to online education, while bumpy, was very successful uh, in, 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 in the end, that it was a heroic effort, that everyone came together and make it, made it work. We're hearing a very different story from students and faculty. Um, so many of them felt that the spring semester was basically a waste as far as learning was concerned. Many of them tuned out, many of them stopped engaging uh, with their faculty and faculty threw up their hands as they tried to figure out how to offer their courses that were almost always in person online. Um, I will say this is imp particularly important for early educators because many of them um, have a part of their education that is taking place in observing the classroom and observing how to um, engage with young children. And those experiences were um, moved to simulation and moved to online. And we heard a lot about that as well. And I, I think there's a sense that that doesn't work quite as well. Um, so we also heard from students who didn't have regular contact with their faculty. We heard from faculty who weren't told what was expected of them as far as um, continuing to engage and teach their students. Um, and we heard a lot about um, those uh, students that were able to take advantage of some of the flexibilities around grading and things with pass fail, but others who couldn't because they actually wanted to go on to transfer to a four year program, for instance, and they didn't know how that four year school would accept that pass fail grade. We heard students actually talk about how they were worried about having um, pandemic degrees, right, where people looked at when they graduated and saw that the education had pivoted online and was not as rigorous as what it was before the pandemic. And they were worried about having that uh, caveat put around their degrees. Um, so this fall, we've heard improved things around teaching and learning, but it's still not going very well for many students. There's a strong preference for being in person for many of these students. And I will say, particularly for the population that is overrepresented by um, uh, early child educators, um, 
people who are maybe older, have caregiving responsibilities, being in person is important to keeping them motivated. And while they like the flexibility of being online, they also need to feel connected to the people in the classroom. And we're hearing that that still isn't going great. Um, uh, so those attending schools with less resources and majors that required hands-on learning are particularly struggling. And early educators are more likely to be attending those institutions. So it's continuing to be a struggle and we're continuing to see how it plays out as time goes on and it gets more difficult. And I'll, with that, I'll turn it back to Claire. Or I can continue. Okay, <laughs> Angela, can you go to the next slide? Um, so what's coming next? Uh, the Trump administration, uh, if so, obviously there's an election coming and depending on what happens with the election changes, um, uh, I think that we're going to see different things. Um, one second, I don't have those notes up, sorry. Um, so with the Trump administration, I think the idea, if they get reelected, um, they're really looking towards deregulating higher education. They're thinking about um, uh, making more flexibility around um, colleges continuing to offer different types of degrees. They are, um, they are uh, eroding some of the ideas. I'm just gonna take a quick pause and see if I can find the notes for this. Here we go. Okay, so um, Congress will likely consider legislation that responds to the pandemic, possibly before the election, but if not, then during the lame duck session between the elections and the new year. There's no word yet on what that's going to look like because colleges are asking for a ton more funding this time around, and many students have seen big drops in income. So many Pell so more Pell funding may be needed, and that adds another hole to the budget. Uh, the payment pause for student loan borrowers with, that my colleague Claire McCann talked about earlier um, is set to expire at the end of the year, and we need to see how students continue to pick back up on those payments and what that does. Um, so as I said, we're a few weeks away from the election, so it's worth noting that the higher education system could look very different in the next couple of years. The Trump administration, as I said, has made uh, deregulation, particularly of regulations that were designed to crack down on for-profit colleges, its legacy for the first term. So if Trump wins a second term, we expect to see more of that and allowing for uh, for-profit colleges to offer more low value credentials and continuing to make it harder for borrowers to get relief if their colleges lie to them or engage in abusive recruiting practices. They could, that could harm early educators if those for-profit institutions see early education as a growth market for them. And they might, as they see the entire early childhood education field as seeking upskilling. So they're really seeing the push for bachelor's degrees as a pop, they could see the push for bachelor's degrees as a possibility for doing more recruiting for those students. So on the other hand, the Biden campaign has made affordability a major priority, proposing to make community colleges tuition free, make public four-year colleges tuition free for low and middle income families and doubling the size of the Pell grads. So those are all really big ticket items. They all cost a lot of money, particularly doubling the size of the Pell grants, um, which will require Congress to spend a lot more new money. And it's not clear if that's in the cards, but additional financial aid for low-income students could have a big benefit for our early childhood educators, as Claire talked about earlier. Uh, but we need to anticipate the administration will be working to reinstate those key Obama administration regulations, like rules requiring colleges to ensure their programs don't lead to affordable, unaffordable amounts of debt, and uh, that were unwound by the Trump administration. We'll obviously know more about this in a couple of weeks, uh, but that's how we're seeing things in the field now. Um, and with that, it looks like my colleague is back. Claire, did I miss anything? No, that was great. Thank you.
All right, so we can move to the next slide. Um, so thank you, Iris and Claire, and to everyone listening. We had some we had some technical difficulties, but Claire is back, and Iris did a great job filling in for Claire while she was absent for a few minutes. Uh, but we got it all figured out. So this was a really helpful overview. Um, and now we're going to switch gears to Q and A. It seems like we have a pretty quiet group. So um, just a reminder to ask ask questions either on the information that Iris and Claire presented or on other higher ed related issues. Um, you can be more state focused if that's what's interesting to you. Um, I will kick us off. Well, first in, in the chat, Olga did mention that she's interested in the implications of the ECE workforce speaking um, other languages. So I wanna first address that briefly before we move into questions um, and give everyone a minute to Put their questions in but um in answer to your um area of interest olga so that is something that we talk about in the um in the paper that we released earlier this month so you know as we know unfortunately institutions often don't have the capacity to meet the to meet the needs of our diverse early childhood student population um, at many institutions courses texts are only offered in english um, advisors might only speak english and this um all of these things put um, students who who English is not their first language at a disadvantage. So in our report, we do highlight two institutions that have acknowledged the need for more bilingual courses. Um, that's Miami Dade College in Miami, Florida, and Southwestern College in Chula Vista, California. Um, they're both taking innovative approaches to supporting their multilingual students in becoming early educators. And so at Miami Dade, they offer a certificate program for pre K teachers um, and another for infant and toddler teachers, which have been translated into Spanish and um, Creole. And um, at Southwestern College, which is located in the southernmost part of California, um, they have a Spanish to English associate teacher certificate that balances Spanish with scaffolded um, ESL instruction. So that program uses a cohort model and consists of for child development courses, which are taught alongside ESL courses. Um, so the courses begin in Spanish and then the final courses are taught in English. So we encourage you to check out um, those profiles in the paper if that's of interest to you. And then um, I will kick us off with, um, with one question before we hear from anyone else. So I know COVID is top of mind for all of us these days and Iris talked a bit about um, her research on COVID. So just curious, are there any innovations or policy changes happening now in response to COVID that should be carried forward um, because they're making the experience better for students or no? Yes. Um, so I will say my sort of um, overall, it's not great, <laughs> but we have done a series of focus groups with students, some of which are more non-traditional students. And we've heard um, some encouraging things. Uh, one of the encouraging things we've heard about is an increase in doing um, remote and technology mediated advising meetings. Um, so basically that's really increased the amount of um, advising that, that people have been able to take advantage of. And that means particularly students who are really busy, who have to be around for caretaking responsibilities, who have really busy lives and who are adults and work. Um, they're allowed, they can actually access the support services better because they now can do them online and through Zoom. And that's huge. Um, the other thing I will say is we have heard uh, mixed things about the sort of using synchronous Zoom um, technologies to help support students. But we do hear that people would love to continue to have that option to, inter to um, view uh, their lectures uh, in the future. So they have that flexibility to either be in class or watch it online. Um, so they, uh, because of their busy lives, have that opportunity. So that's another thing we've heard that I think should probably continue into the future. Claire, do you have anything to add? No, I, I think that pretty much covers it. Um, I would say overall, yeah, we definitely are hearing a lot of students are really struggling, both with the technology and with the isolation uh, that comes with not being in the classroom. Um, that can make it very difficult for students to engage in the work um, and succeed in their courses. And so 
uh, that's a piece that I think people will need to grapple with, institutions in particular will need to grapple with a lot more in the coming months. Great, thanks both of you. Um, so my next question would be, what are the most important levers for early childhood state advocates to try and pull on, whether that's um, state level levers or um, federal levers? Yeah, so I can talk a little bit about the state levers and if Claire, you wanna do the federal. Um, so obviously the sort of uh, cratering and funding of institutions, <laughs> I don't know if that's something you can prevent necessarily because we are gonna see some really difficult budget situations for states and there's only so many places they can cut. So, but I will say continuing to advocate for um, adequate funding for community colleges and for regional publics that are, I, I think, really serving the vast majority of this population is incredibly important. Um, other things uh, we could pull on at the state level, uh, state um, sys or system-wide uh, level is thinking about bringing colleges together to innovate and provide support services for these types of populations and actually design um, their programs to support these types of populations. And we talk a little bit about that in the, in the uh, paper, the ASAP program, for instance. Yes, it needs additional funding, but a lot of it is also about program design and thinking about how to design the program to support this population and help keep them engaged and enrolled in the college. Claire? To add on to what Iris is saying there, um, you know, one of the biggest problems we've seen that has really driven up the cost of college significantly has been state disinvestment in higher education um, and inadequate federal funding make a difference there. Um, so one of the most important things that Congress could do in this regard is create a federal state partnership program that gives a federal incentive to states to continue to keep up their investments in public higher education. Um, public higher education is educating almost three quarters of students across the country. Um, and if you could really make a meaningful difference in how much how much funding those schools have to rely on year after year, um, you could make a sizable dent in what the college what the cost of college for students looks like. And that's what all of the free college proposals that have been floating around for the last few years are built upon is really this notion of creating that partnership um, and, and you know creating a way to use that federal money to create the incentive for uh, reducing college costs to zero for at least some students. Um, that's, I think, one of the most important things. As Ira said, uh, you know, more funding is needed for some of these student success interventions. The federal government has historically not done a ton uh, to invest in those kinds of programs, and they do have significant upfront costs. Um, they require a lot more from the college in terms of advising and staff support and tutoring and all kinds of other uh, redesign uh, academic and, and advising experiences. And so that's another place where the federal government could step up and really make that upfront investment, um, give colleges a reason to take on these programs. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is uh, Title II of the Higher Education Act uh, covers educator preparation programs broadly. Um, that's a really, um, that's one place where I think there's a lot of potential for um, early education to get more of a specific call out in some of those programs to fund some of them, the promising interventions that are identified in the report um, and, and to spell out that early, the early educator workforce is an important piece of funding educator preparation. Great, thank you so much. Um, that was really helpful. So another question, we have a, a few more, um, is are there supports in place for early educators who are attending institutions that are struggling financially and might need to transfer credits to finish their degree in the event of a closure. You do the closure part, Claire. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is kind of a, a bit of a trend in recent years um, has been an increasing number of college closures. Far too many of those have been precipitous closures that happen with little to no warning. They might happen mid semester or mid year. 
um, and they leave students with too few options. Um, the main mechanism that has that is kind of generally used to prevent that from happening and to make sure students have options to continue their education after a closure um, is a teach out agreement between two institutions. And typically those have been required by accreditors of very, very high risk institutions. Um, so this is actually something that the higher education program has been doing some work on is um, what we're seeing is accreditors not doing this early enough or often enough um, with institutions that are at a su substantial risk of potential closure. Um, and with the enrollment trends, the way they're looking now, um, we would hope to see accreditors increasing their focus on these teach out agreements during the pandemic. That's not really what we're hearing. What we're hearing much more of is more monitoring, but less, uh, less fewer requirements, less um, direct uh, intervention at institutions that do look like they're at a high risk. And, and largely what we've heard from accreditors is that they're looking for ways to stay, stay out of the way as institutions try to adapt and kind of muddle through the situation. So I think this is one really important place that regulators, which includes accreditors, but also states and the Department of Education can step up to protect students. It kind of cuts against the incentive of the institution to do this planning uh, because it does make them feel like they're admitting uh, that there's a potential risk of closure. And so it's something, so it's a place where regulators really need to be the ones looking out and having the backs of the students at the institution. And I'll just add as far as transfer is concerned, we actually think there's going to be an increased transfer of students just in general in response to COVID. Um, because student, a lot of students maybe are starting at different colleges than where they would have gone otherwise. And there's, there we do anticipate that there's going to be a, a large uptick, probably including um, early childhood educators. And so uh, we are um, working on a brief right now that kind of helps colleges think through what that means and what it means for them to recognize the sort of swirling credits that are very likely to come out of this situation. Uh, right now, we're not hearing colleges being really proactive and thinking far ahead about this. And so um, we, we are trying to guide them in that direction as the situation wears on. Great, thank you both. Um, so the next question we'll, we'll respond to is um, from Sharon Sullivan. And she said, she asked or said comment question. Um, At TEACH, we are finding that support for new online learners has been an essential part of adapting to COVID. Are there good tools that other folks have identified for new online learners, particularly around practicum experiences? So I can, I can try to answer this from what I know and um, Claire and Iris, you can also weigh in. I think this might also be a good opportunity if anybody on the webinar has tools that they want to share in the chat. Um, you might also be privy to some that we are not aware of. Um, but so addressing practicum experiences and the, um, the challenges around both access and quality was something that our working group spent time on last year. And of course, that was um, that work happened pre-COVID. Um, but so, you know, even before COVID, it was difficult for a lot of teachers to, a lot of early education um, students to have time to um, complete practicum requirements outside of their current place of work, and it's even more challenging now. Um, we know that that NACI um, did a survey in the spring, so again, you know, things have changed since the spring, but they um, talked to respondents about how they were handling um, field experiences due to COVID. And it, it appeared that a lot of institutions were, you know, adapting quickly and finding ways to ensure that um, candidates could observe teaching and learning and practice the skills used in their coursework. So the most common was um, using videos and reflections to replace field experiences. Um, some students were able to meet with children and families virtually. Others videotaped themselves implementing curriculum um, with or without actual children present. Um, so, you know, the use of video and technology is, um, is has, was very popular um, and about one third of survey respondents, and again, this was in the spring, um, gave their students more time to complete the requirements. Of course, at the time, they might not have foreseen that the fall would also be remote for a lot of people. Um, so I'd be curious to, 
to hear, learn more about what institutions are doing this fall. Um, but this was one area that we kind of, as a, as a group thought that maybe lessons could be learned from COVID um, in, in terms of the reflex, the flexibility for teachers um, and the use of technology that maybe would be useful after the pandemic is over, um, since it's a challenge that people identified before. So I don't know, Claire and Iris, if you want to add anything to that. I just want to add that when we spoke with over 20 community colleges this um, this summer, we were actually trying to dig into what were practicums, what was hands-on experience in across all different kinds of fields. We heard very similar things to what you're saying, Abby, that a lot of them were using video. I do wonder, though, if using video uh, is a high quality practicum experience and what people think about that, because it was definitely difficult for um, a lot of the different um, occupations we heard about in health and in um, the building trades and some of these others to use videos um, in that way. So I'd be curious to know how that's playing out right now. Yes, many of them were doing socially distant um, labs. So they would have like one person come in, but that's even more difficult in a classroom. Uh, and most of them were thinking they were gonna get back to normal uh, in the fall. So just to confirm everything you said, Abby. It does look like um, there have been some resources shared in the chat, so I encourage people to check those out as well. Um, okay, and another question we got um, that Claire and Iris, you might have um, you might have some thoughts on. So this is from Mary Ma, and she. Um, said as a college which is online by design and was already online when the pivot happened um is there a distinct difference between remote learning and true online education um and that this distinction should be made claire do you have strong feelings about this i know there's a lot of strong feelings about this in the online education community yeah i mean i think what i think a lot of what we saw this spring was not it was not high quality online education at a minimum. Um, what we saw was people taking their existing PowerPoint and throwing it into a Zoom and trying to, um, to run it that way, which just simply wasn't a great experience for anyone. It wasn't a great experience for faculty. It wasn't great for students. Um, there are institutions and, uh, and instructional designers who have spent many, many years trying to to refine and perfect how you can effectively offer a program online. Um, and, and the difference is absolutely stark between that high quality experience and the low quality one. I think taking a step back from what the nature of the program is, one thing we do see sort of generally speaking in distance education is that certain subgroups of students really struggle with that format regardless. Um, and in particular, uh, first time students and students who uh, require remedial education or do not come in academically prepared will really, really struggle with the format. Um, and I think, I think, you know, all the best engagement of faculty in the world is not going to completely solve that problem, but it does require thinking about it a little bit differently when you're serving those kinds of students and thinking about what kind of supports they need thinking about how you can best meet the needs of those groups that we know are gonna have a hard time with an online format, pretty much no matter what. Online is great for self-directed learners. Um, it's very difficult for learners who need more support. So the equity concerns here are substantial. We heard a lot, we heard a lot about um, actually faculty really, really struggling with the technology just in general. Um, so some of the things we've heard around making that better was um, assigning student workers to different courses to help facilitate the use of the technology and walk the faculty through the technology use. The other thing we heard about to address some of the issues Claire raises about um, how if you're not a self-directed learner, it can be very difficult to engage online is a really around creating community in a way that um, like transcends the online experience. So trying to do outreach to students, trying to create cohorts of students, trying to 
um, really connect students together in breakout rooms and different ways so they're, that you're creating a community that um, supports maybe a learner who's less self-directed. We've heard a lot about how when you're in a classroom and you're sitting next to somebody, you get a lot of passive learning from them and you don't necessarily get that in an online environment. So you really have to be deliberate about, in, about creating that. And, no, and, and most people didn't know how to do that in the spring. Thank you both. Um, and I just wanted to comment on or raise up a comment. So Edith Locke said, you know, thank you for acknowledging the Teach Early Childhood Scholarship programs. Passionately teach administrative homes have been instrumental in higher ed retention and have provided additional supports to participants to help ameliorate some COVID impact. And um, I just want to give a plug to, you know, we do, we did cover teach in our, in our report. Um, it came up over and over again, teach early childhood scholarships were instrumental to allowing many of the other promising practices um, that we identified in the report function well. Um, for anyone who's not familiar, um, Teach Early Childhood program provides scholarships to early educators to pr pursue debt-free higher education. It covers the cost of tuition, fees, books, um, recipients work with a dedicated counselor, employers offer paid release time and agree to provide a pay increase to those who complete their program and remain at their job. And um, in 2019, I believe TEACH was in 22 states and Washington DC and had um, somewhere over 17,000 recipients. So um, we, it's definitely a program that um, we touched on and realized the impact it has and we cover it more in the paper if anybody's interested. I wish more occupations had programs like that. It's great. And I think we have, we have a few minutes left. Um, if anyone has additional questions, I believe we have covered all of the ones in the chat. If I missed any, please, um, please feel free to add them now. Or if you, didn't feel like I answered yours. If we addressed yours correctly, this is this is your final um, final call. Yes, we can. Um, Irita, we will re put the link for the paper in. I can add that right now. Um, and you know, this is an ongoing body of work at New America. Our early ed team is going to be. Um, following institutions um, specifically related to COVID that we think are doing innovative um, innovative things to serve early educators over the following year. So if you know of any that you think might be of interest to us, well, please reach out to us. Um, we would love to, love to learn more and keep this work going. And um, all right, so we can move to the, to the final slide, Angela. Great, um, so, that concludes our webinar for today. Um, if you're interested in following our work, whether related to this project or early education more broadly, we encourage you to subscribe to our weekly newsletter or follow us on social media. Um, thank you again for attending. Thank you for the great questions and we hope you have a great rest of your day. <laughs>